The scripture reading today is taken from the uh, First Kings, chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. It's on page 7 if you'd like to follow along. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Zidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The word of God for the people of God. morning everyone we can sense the desperation and hopelessness of this woman as she faced the prospect of no more resources no more food and God made a way for her in the middle of that hopeless situation may he do the same for us today father we look to you now give us give us the anointing to proclaim and to hear your, your word in this hour. Holy Spirit, come, bear witness to the truth of your word in our hearts as we say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. For the first four Sundays, actually all of the four Sundays of September, the Brook Hill pastors are sharing some favorite stories from the Bible in a series called I Love to Tell the Story. This morning I'm sharing about Elijah, a prophet of God who lived 30 centuries ago, about 150 years after the great King David of Israel and 860 years before the time of Jesus Christ. Let's say to begin with that if you don't believe in miracles, you will have some difficulty with this man, Elijah. Among other things... In these several chapters that give an account of his life and ministry, he declared a three-year drought over the nation of Israel. This was a weather miracle. He prayed for a dead child who came to life again. He prayed successfully for fire to come down from heaven and consumed a water-drenched sacrifice. That was the pinnacle that my wife wanted me to preach about when I said I was preaching about Isaiah. Uh, He left this earthly life in a flying chariot of fire. And finally, along with Moses, he appeared and spoke with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration nine centuries after his earthly life. So if you don't believe in miracles, you might have some difficulty with Elijah. But let me ask, do we believe in miracles? That was pretty strong. Let me ask that just one more time. Don't say yes if you don't believe it, but do we believe in miracles? Yes. Yes, we do. We believe that God 
does signs and wonders to reveal his glory and to help his people. As we think about this man, Elijah, he seems like a wild man. John the Baptist was later compared to him. And we wonder if Elijah, like John, lived in the desert and wore clothing made of camel's hair. And if, like John, he ate locusts for breakfast and wild honey. We want to look this morning at three early adventures from Elijah's ministry as Bev has shared them, has read them for us. Adventure 1, Elijah announces a great drought. There in verse 1, the whole adventure is contained in one verse. At this time, Ahab was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom of ten of the tribes of Israel. That ten tribe northern kingdom never had a king who was a righteous king, and Ahab was perhaps the worst of the lot. He did not follow Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a matter of political convenience, he married the Phoenician princess Jezebel from what is now the territory of, of Lebanon, and Jezebel became queen of Israel. We know that Jezebel has become kind of a name for a certain kind of woman, but we won't go there. <laughs> Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal, supposedly the lord of fertility and storms, the god of the wind and the rain. And uh, in Israel had often been led astray over these uh, years at this per period of time to follow false gods. And many of them during Ahab's reign came to follow this foreign god who was no god at all. Eventually, King Ahab provided financial support for 450 priests of Baal. It says they ate at his table. It was a big table. It was a big meal every day providing for these 450 priests of the, prophet, of the idol Baal. So one day, the prophet Elijah shows up at Ahab's palace in Samaria, and he declares himself to be a worshiper of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And he declares that there will be no more dew or rain in Israel until further notice to begin with, this was a direct confrontation to the false god Baal, who was supposedly the god of rain. And then Elijah, who no doubt appeared quickly, leaves as quickly as he has come. And we can imagine Ahab saying, who was that guy? Where did he come from and where did he go? Of course, in our modern time, he wouldn't even make it past the security fence. But in that day and time, he made it all the way to the throne room, apparently. It would have taken a great deal of faith or foolishness to show up before the king with such a declaration. Can you imagine yourself being approached by the Spirit of God who said to you, Yes, I want you to go to the king. And I want you to declare that there will be no more dew or rain until further notice. Your response would be like mine. Who is that voice speaking to me? Was that the pizza from last night? What was that? <laughs> we would wrestle with it and we wonder if Elijah wrestled with a message like that. But ultimately he obeyed and Elijah's prophecy came true. Now, the Bible book of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time to keep silent and a time to speak. I believe that there is a reason why the time to keep silent was first in that phrase, and then the time to speak was the last part of the phrase, because if you're like me, there are ten times when you need to keep silent and you speak to every one time that you need to speak and you stay silent. Can I have a witness to that? Yes. We are a mouthy lot. <laughs> but there is a time to speak up, friends. And we need all of the discernment that we can get. We need all of the wisdom that we can get. But we need to speak up against wickedness, against injustice, against those who oppress the poor and powerless. Ultimately, Esau, Esau, rather, Elijah obeyed God and he became a spiritual hero. 
As we think of Elijah's confrontation with Ahab, I pray that God will help us to have discernment, knowing when to speak up and when to shut up. May God give us courage and wisdom and faith when it's time actually to speak, that one time in ten perhaps when we need to speak up. So that's adventure number one. Adventure two, Elijah was fed by ravens in verses two through six. The The condensed version of this is, The word of the Lord came to him and said, Hide in the Kareth ravine, drink from the brook. I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. Now the Kareth ravine was remote. It was as far away as he could get in Israel from where King Ahab was there in Samaria. It was a great hiding place a deep valley, a marshy place with a brook running through it, a great hiding place. And it might have been good for most of us for a day or two or maybe a week. But most of us would have a great deal of difficulty hanging in a place like that for very long. Wouldn't you get antsy? God was providing the miracle of provision of food wouldn't you get a little tired in the, in the evening looking to the same thing that you had gotten in the morning? Okay, here comes the raven. Here's my bread. Here's my meat. Same old, same old. We'd have difficulty with that. And we don't know for sure whether Elijah did or not, but it seems to us to be a reminder of this. It reminds us that God's people must often share in the sufferings of others. Not only was Israel suffering because of the lack of rain, but Elijah was participating in that suffering. Sometimes it seems like we are stuck in our own Kareth ravine. Have you ever been stuck somewhere? In a place that was all right maybe for a day or two, but it grew old kind of quickly, and you did not know how long that time at the ravine would last. Sometimes it seems like God is not doing anything too quickly. And we may wonder if we are stuck in the ravine and if we will ever get out of there. This is the age of microwave popcorn and instant messaging, and it would be good if God would do things like that. But often He doesn't. My wife has been in a situation for for five years now where she has been the executor of both her mom and dad's will and the state's. You know, how long should that take? Five years. And she's kind of stuck there. And it's not the totality of her life, but it is a place just of irritation. One devotional writer mentions the late Chuck Colson who indicated that his time in prison lying on a rotten floor of a cell was perhaps the greatest blessing of his life. Sometimes God puts us at a place and he wants to help us grow. He wants to teach us. He wants to work in us in a way that he can't do in three minutes. And it takes a while. It takes a while. In the previous service, we sang a song called Hope Will Rise As We Wait Upon the Lord. God wants to give us hope in the middle of those Kareth Ravine situations, but sometimes it will require some waiting. And we're not so good, are we, at waiting upon the Lord? Waiting. Hope will rise as we wait upon the Lord. So maybe you're in a Kareth ravine right now. Be encouraged. God has you there for a reason. Look up and watch. There may be a raven coming your way. Adventure number three, Elijah and the widow at Zarephath. And I'm not going to recount the reading of the full scripture, but you got the gist of what was happening. After the brook had dried up, God directed Elijah out of the country of Israel into what was then Phoenicia, now Lebanon. This is in the story a bit here. And to a particular woman that God had already spoken to, he comes to this village of Zarephath. He sees the woman. He asks for 
a drink of water and for a little bread. And she tells him her story. She has just a little flour in her jar. She has just a little olive oil in, in the other jar. And she just has enough for a final loaf of bread for her and her son. And we can tell her desperation. She said, I was just going to do this and die. And so we sense that desperation, that hopelessness within her. Perhaps you have been there. Maybe not in a Kareth Brook situation, but maybe in a widow with just a little meal and just a little, just a little oil. Sometimes our resources seem pretty small when we're faced with the situations that we face. Maybe you're a caregiver and you feel like you have no more to give after a long period of caring for someone. Perhaps you're a spouse in a troubled marriage and you've given and given and given and you feel like there's nothing left to give. Even a teacher perhaps and you have a student that you can't find the key to and you're, you're trying to find some way to get through to that child and and it's like you have few resources to give to this and, and you need God to help you with the breakthrough. Perhaps you're trying to serve the Lord in some area of ministry and the need is so great and your own capacity seems so small. That's what a number of us who, who labor with the downtown ministry feel like. You know, you have, you have poverty all around. You have... You have people who are homeless, people who have no employment, people who are alcoholics and addicts, people who have mental health issues. And my little teaspoon feels just like the one teaspoon that's going to be poured into the ocean of need. Our resources are pretty small. And very often, very often, if God is going to do something, He's going to have to take, we're going to have to give Him that little bit, and then He will do something miraculous with it, as He did for this widow in this situation. She gave all she had, and God took the small resource and made a miracle. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. And I want to encourage you today that if you're in that situation, that He will make a way for you as well. He will make a way for you in, in all of the challenges, in all of the hopelessness that you feel. Take heart and look to Him. He is ready and willing and able to meet you at your place of need. His resources are limitless. Take courage because there is no shortage with God. So receive these three simple messages from the life of Elijah. Speak up courageously against evil and injustice. And endure the Kareth Ravine experience, that dark night of the soul, for God is with you in that period of time that you think may never end. And then give God all of your meager resources and watch Him multiply those resources as you put your trust in Him. Father, we thank You for the way that You in your great capacity, meet us at our place of incapacity, at our place of small resources. We're thankful that you are our hope and our encouragement on every day, whether it's a day that feels where we feel full of plenty and, and ready to go and to conquer the world, or whether it's a day that we're struggling and feeling our own need of a whole lot more. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to learn these lessons. Help us to, be, to have the faith to see your hand in things that seem to be difficult in our lives. And we say yes to you. Yes to hope. Yes to your great resources. Yes to your kingdom and the work that you're doing in us and through us as your people. And we, ask, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.